Yeah, it's rainy today, off and on. Yesterday it rained all day. Trying to attack. Yeah, same here. Mm. It was like 41 degrees almost all day. Yeah, that's about how it is here. A little actually, that's kind of crazy. I think we might have been a little bit warmer than you. After and I'm up in just, Chicago. We just had a week of like being 70s and 80s. Wow. Yeah, that's got to be weird. Not quite snow for the dog, though. <laughs> Our kids thought it was snowing yesterday, and it was one of the trees that has white poppies on it was falling ah, ah. in the wind. That's They're like, it's mom is snowing. <laughs> Can you, you hear me like, okay? Um, when you first started, no, you were breaking up. It was like I was hearing every other word. But I can okay. hear you right now. Yeah, I've got, I don't know, my legs fell asleep when we were talking last time. I was at a high top <laughs> table. <laughs> and I was like, he looks so comfortable. I'm going to have to find another spot. So I figured I'd go in this chair, but I have nowhere to put my microphone. So, yeah. and I was kind of loud. Uh, because I'm on dialysis, when I used to go to in-center dialysis, you sit in a recliner and... Just so used to that, it's so comfortable. And um, when they told me I, I, that I qualified for home dialysis and I, I was getting into that, I said, uh, what chair will I be sitting in when I do it? Do I have to do it in my own chair? Because I don't own a recliner. And so they said, well, let, let's look into that. So they looked into it for me and it, it's rated as medical equipment because all the DeVitas in the United States have recliners as their chairs. So it's rated as medical equipment. So they gave me a recliner for free. Yay! Yay! <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and it's just like it. the ones we have. Yeah. Well, that's good. At least it's comfortable because you got to sit there for a couple hours, right? Three, four yeah. hours, something like that. Man, man, oh man. Okay. You know, I'm going to ask, can you kick off a prayer for us tonight? Sure. What do you want? Just, you know, a little prayer of protection. That'll work. I mean, you might as well go to the, to the man who used to be the, the one putting curses and spells on people or spells on people at least, you know, and have you protect us this time. I just thought about that when I was coming down here with with my coffee, because I need it today. <laughs> okay. You want me to do it now? Yeah, yeah. We'll kick it off with, with your prayer. All right. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Um, um, St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, bust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much. All righty. So we covered a lot last time and I was thinking, you know, a lot of this has been on other videos. So I thought we would twist and shift it up a little bit today, but I did have a couple of uh, questions because I was watching the video and I even confused myself and I was in the, in the conversation <laughs> with you. <laughs> Leave it to me to yeah. be confused. You ask a lot of stuff that most interviewers don't ask. Did and I really? I, okay. Cool. You actually you actually ask questions. A lot of interviewers get me and they're like, go. And as, and I tell a talk basically in their interview. And I just it's my talk from beginning to end. You know, an hour and a half later I'm done with it. And they never say anything. They never ask anything. Well, yeah, just, okay, good. There you go. Okay. Well, that's good. I thought I I mean I know I needed some clarification because I'm still confused. 
on the ones that believe in Satan, the ones that don't believe in Satan and God and all that kind of stuff. So we'll cover that. But one thing that I got tripped up on was, you remember that, I know you remember the house that you described to the people in Canada. It was this one story white house with the fence and all that kind of stuff. Was that the house that you went to when you were a no. kid at 13? So no. there was a different style house. Well, can you describe this house? Because I kept wet, racking my brain thinking, how do you fit all those people in a house that I would think would be a big home? But can you describe yeah, it? It is, it? it is a big home. Um, it was two stories high. In the backyard is a swimming pool. Uh, they also have um, near the back porch was an in-ground barbecue pit. Um, the house was easily, if they had a party there, they could easily fit 300 people in there. It was big. It was wow. one of the biggest places in, in the town I grew up. And, and there was more than just that house. There was multiple houses like that. When we shot videos, we normally went... Um, there was a couple of houses in town. There was a warehouse in town, and that was rented by them. Uh, there was also neighboring towns and abandoned buildings that I don't know how they got access because they had keys to the buildings. And we would go in those buildings, and they'd lock the door behind us, and then we'd you know, shoot all of our scenes there. We were in. Exactly. Uh, you just answered my second question. Where did you film the the movies? Because you said that it wasn't in that house. Wow, that's right. That's pretty crazy. Now you did say a lot of these people that were in the coven were business owners, so maybe they knew someone who had those yeah. warehouses and got gave them the keys, and they were all a part of it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, that was my second well, question. Go ahead. Okay. No, it was just. There was a building in, I think the name of the town is South Bay. So when you go from Clewiston to West Palm Beach, for example, you pass through South Bay and through Bow Blade, and then you go to West Palm Beach. So in South Bay, when you go in, you enter the town from one road, you get to a traffic light and you turn left, and that takes you to Bow Blade. But when you enter that traffic, that little intersection, there's a building on the corner that as far as I know was abandoned and closed my entire life. And back when I was 12 years old, we used to go to that building and shoot porno there. Wow, was it like just, I mean, did they have a room that was furnished? And I mean, I don't know why I'm asking these details. <laughs> it was originally I think, a business of some kind. And all the windows were boarded up. You couldn't see into it. And when you got inside, initially, there's a large room that has broken glass in it, broken bottles, and an old bad-looking mattress, like maybe you know, a homeless person slept there or something. But in the other rooms, they're fully furnished. OK. So it looks like a normal house or whatever when you're doing the the filming, so to speak. When you're doing the filming, they, they put um, um, stuff in there to make it look like, you know, it, it's like it's they've got props of every kind. So it looks like a bedroom or it looks like an office or it looks like a doctor's office, you know, or, you know, it just looks like somebody's bedroom or it looks like a bathroom. Yeah, like sets. They kind of make them yes. look like a certain yes. set. Okay. Right. All right. Cool. Okay. All right. So we got in, we didn't get very far <laughs> last time, but yet we did. So we got to where you had just blood signed yourself into the coven. You became an official quote unquote Satanist. Um, and you were, you, well, I guess, participated, which you really just got blood on your hands. The first abortion. Can you explain that? Um, now you're getting into a point where you're getting older, a couple years go by, and now you're not so wanted on these films, and you're kind of feeling not so good about yourself, might have even contemplated suicide at, at one point in time, because 
here you were, the big star, the one that everybody wanted, yeah, and now you're not yet. I went from being in demand and us getting letters and cards from people saying that you know they wanted to see the dark skinned boy or Tommy uh, perform and they wanted to see him perform with certain girls and they would name everybody who they wanted to see and what acts they wanted to see. And you know, I felt like I was a movie star. You know, people are seeing my movie. Like we got a letter from Japan, you know, and it was written like like a child had written it. And it never occurred to me when I was a kid that these weren't children writing to us. You know, I thought it was I thought it was kids. You know, I didn't know it was an adult that was picking up a crayon and writing it. And um, you know, they're they're requesting all this stuff, so I know that people are watching me perform all over the world. You know, and I feel important. And then suddenly, and I turned 16 and I grew a mustache. And people stopped writing in. People stopped requesting me. There was even some people that said, it's too bad Tommy grew a mustache. You know, we don't want to see him anymore in these movies because he doesn't look like a kid anymore. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and being told that, I mean, read, they read me the letter, you know, and you know, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. And I went from being on top of the world and in demand and everybody wanted to see me to no one wants to see me, you know? And mm -hmm. there was there was a day that I had decided that my life seemed on top of the world to me being, having the weight of the world on me. And I put a large butcher knife in my backpack and I was going to go, there, there was a lake in my town. So that is probably, the, I think it's the largest natural lake or maybe a man-made lake. It's Lake Okeechobee. And there's a place where you can crawl down. Uh, there's like a ladder that goes down to like a walkway that sits right on the water. And there's a fence there. So you can't stick your hand in the water and get it, get a finger bitten off by a gar or by an alligator. You can't get bit by a snake. So, but you can watch everything happen right there. And you're sitting right on the water, basically. And I figured I would just slice my wrist right there and just fade away. It's a beautiful spot to look at. I can see birds and fish and alligators and snakes. You know, and I'll just expire right there. And I was walking out of the house. I was 16 years old. And I was heading out of the house and my dad said, where are you going? I said, out. And he says, when are you going to be back? And I said, later. <laughs> and I walk out and he grabs me and won't let me go. And I'm trying to get away and he holds on to me and he wants to see what's in my backpack. And I didn't want to show him what's in my backpack. And he, I don't know if his instincts kicked in, but he gave me a hug. And he gave me a long hug and I started crying. Oh. And, and he took off my backpack, opened it up, saw a knife in the back of it, and realized that I wasn't going to go out and rob somebody. I was probably going to kill myself. And he gave me a long hug, held me really tight, let me all, let me cry everything out. And then he said, we'll talk about it later when you're up to it. And then we never talked about it again. Oh, my goodness. It never came up again. And I'm imagining that he didn't know what to say. He didn't know how to handle it. And you either, right? Well, I'm the one that went through it, but I couldn't tell my dad. Oh, by the way, I used to be a porn star. And yeah. No one wants to see me perform. You know, I couldn't bring that up. You know, I couldn't tell him everything I was doing. Wow. You know, so the things that made me feel better was more magic and more drugs. Huh. Oh, my gosh. That's so awesome. Thank God that your dad did that because, I mean, that's kind of 
what Satan really wants is doesn't he want everyone to destroy themselves? So, I mean, your dad just kind of jumped in and saved you, which is interesting for your dad to probably have the spirit move him to grab you and hug you. That's right. normal for him, right? That's uh, odd for my dad. That's very yeah. odd behavior. Yeah. Oh, he's that's not, beautiful. He's not a grabber and hugger kind of guy. Is he's your dad like, still around? No. He, di he died in 2014. So did he uh, did he know your story? I no, my uh, my cousin is Baptist, and he actually knows my story. And when I came back, he said, "I I read your story, and I've seen videos of it." And he goes, "If you tell your dad, that'll be what pushes him over the edge." So I would recommend you don't tell him. Mm. I never told my dad. Now, I would say he knows now. Right. right. Wow. But he also knows the good ending, <laughs> too. Right. So, you know, I think, again, we all have crosses. And there's a reason, I believe, that a lot of us have lives that, you know, while I wasn't a Satanist, I've done a lot of things let, that you've done. I mean, I was addicted to porn myself. I saw my first porn film at 11 years old. Um, I was promiscuous. I, you know, slept with people because I wanted them to like me and love me. I got into drugs and alcohol, just pretty much marijuana and, and alcohol, basically. You know, I had a little bit of acid, a little bit of I never did cocaine. I think God protected me from that because I would snort my life away. So, I mean, you know, and, and now I'm here to tell people about it and, and show people how the love of Jesus and Mary and the Catholic faith and the sacraments fills that hole that we're seeking, you know, that maybe we didn't get from our parents or we didn't get from our family and friends and coworkers and all that kind of stuff. So, wow, that's a great story. Go ahead. My, my wife has wished multiple times she had my faith that you know like any anything happens i pull out a, a rosary and i you know let's pray and it. and you know we had our car broke down and it had broke down once before and it broke with the same problem and you can put a band-aid on it for eight hundred dollars or you can fix the problem for four thousand i didn't have four thousand so we put a band-aid on it and they told us this might last a couple of months, it might last a year. But when it breaks again, you're going to have to do the big fix. So it lasted eight months. And we prayed about it. And I prayed that either, I prayed in Novena to St. Expeditus. He's my favorite saint. And it could either, I need $800, 4000 or a new car. I don't know if God can do anything. So whatever he wants to do for me, I'll take it. This woman called me on day eight of the Novena, and she said, let me know when my letter gets there. I'm sending you $4,000. And here and, you uh, used to make spells and cast spells to get money, and now you're praying. <laughs> I right, know right. And then a few weeks after that, we needed another $1,000 for the car. You know, one of my friends said, maybe you're throwing money away. I said, then God wouldn't give me the money. So it was four days after we said the second novena, we got another thousand dollars for the car. So we've been able to fix it twice. Um, my, my favorite story about my, my faith is she woke me up one morning, really early in the morning, and to tell me that the bathtub, the sink, and the toilet weren't draining. What are we going to do? And uh, so I pulled off my rosary and I said, get a rosary. And I said, we're going to pray to God about the problem. So I prayed to God about the problem, about fixing the problem. Then I put my rosary back on. She goes, now what do we do? I said, I'm going back to bed. I'm going back to bed. And she's like, but, but, but we have this problem. I said, no, we don't. I gave the problem to God. It's his problem. He'll fix it. I went back to bed. Now, at the end of the night, we were going to bed. And I said, so let's see. You woke me up early. You said a rosary. I give the problem to God. The guy came over, fixed everything. 
is everything fixed right now? She's like, yes. Said, so the rosary worked? She goes, yes. Said, I'm going back to bed. And uh, you know, she's like, I wish I had your faith. I said, my faith is not, it wasn't instant. I earned my faith. I got to be this way. I didn't instantly walk on the scene and go, God will, God will fix this problem. It's God's problem. Like, Let's pray to St. Expeditus and take care of the problem. I wasn't always like that. I had, you know, I was given miraculous medal and, you know, everything that happened to my salvation that, you know, we're not going to skip ahead to right now and say and, and ruin the interview, but we all know what happened there. Not everybody listening, but you do. So mm -hmm. fast forward, I moved in with my parents to take care of them for the last six and a half years of life. And I got them on, um, well, what's that called when you're in your final stages in the hospice? Ah, yeah. My parents were on hospice for six and a half years. And, you know, most people get on, they're dead in 30 days. Hope right. Hospice in Florida is amazing. Like, they kept my parents alive. They made them comfortable. They kept them happy. My mother, when I met her again, um, I hadn't seen her in 17 years. She'd had dementia for six years when I came back home. And so we had to take care of both my mom and my dad for the final six and a half years. I had heard when I'd been taking care of her for three years, I heard that it was possible to get my mother absolution. My mother had had Louis body dementia at this point for nine years. She doesn't know me. She doesn't know her other son. She doesn't even know her husband. She's been married. At the time that my dad died, my parents had been married for 64 years. Wow. My dad was in love with her when he died. And, but my mother had dementia and didn't know who this old man was. She remembered herself as being 17 years old and her dad, her husband was 20. So when my dad would flirt with her, she would say things like, you're a really nice man. You're very sweet. But if you're here, when my husband gets home, he's going to beat your ass. <laughs> and, you know, and yeah, it was funny, but you know, my dad's like, I'm your husband. That's right. That's got to be hard for him and you. Yeah. And we have this very ornate giant mirror in the living room. She would look in that mirror and wave and say, that's the preacher's wife because she sees a woman that's in her 70s in the mirror and she knows she's 17 years old. So that can't be her. It can't be a mirror, it's a window. So wow. I found out me and my ex-wife went to um, St. Raphael. It was um, a Catholic church in Lehigh Acres, Florida. And it was Father Cooney who is now since deceased, and Father Bradus, who was also who died five years prior. Father Bradus was the happiest priest in the world. Like he knew where he was going, and he was happy with the Blessed Mother, and just but in love with life, and loved to eat. He was a thin man who owned Perkins, basically. He would go <laughs> in there, he'd see the giant round table. He would sit there and fill it with food and then eat all of it while he sat there. And Perkins, and, uh, for those who don't know, is like a buffet kind of restaurant, right? Um, as far as I know, it's not a it's not a buffet. It wasn't a buffet no. in Florida, but Morrison's I might be wrong. Me. Morrison's okay. is a buffet. But um, he would just fill that table up with food. You'd order like everything on the menu and then just have this massive meal. You know, and he'd invite you to sit with him you know, and he's like, hey, enjoy, you know, help yourself to my food, you know, and, and I'm eating it too. So very joy-filled man. So we walked back into the sacristy and I told him that I'd heard that I might could get my mother absolution. But my mother had grown up Catholic and then she converted to being a Baptist so she could marry my dad. So she got all of her sacraments except marriage. When she got dementia, 
she walked out of the house a couple of times, three times actually, and had to be brought back by the sheriff's office. All three times, the sheriff's office asked her, what are you looking for? What can we help you find? And she said she was looking for a Catholic church. Wow. So we started taking her to daily mass. And father said, she can't take the Eucharist, but she thinks she's Catholic. God will recognize that as being Catholic. She can come in and attend the mass. She can get the grace from being there. You know, we just can't give her the Eucharist. I'm like, that's fine. She loved coming in. She loves to see priests. She's always happy when she sees a, a, a man in a cassock, you know, and she was so friendly and her smile would lighten up. And so we walked back and we said, what would it take to get my mother absolution? And Father Bredis said, your mother would have to have a moment of clarity where that she knows exactly what we're talking about. And if she understands exactly what we're talking about, I can give her absolution. And my heart sunk into my stomach and just was heartbroken. My mother hasn't known me for the six years I've been taking care of her. Well, for the three years I've been taking care of her. She doesn't know who I am. She, she's been married for 61 years at this point. Doesn't know who my dad is. You know, she doesn't know anybody in the family. You know, she she doesn't she doesn't even know when she eats certain food, she doesn't even know what it is. You know, and I just for some reason doubted that the same God that did the things for me at my conversion could do that same thing and make her lucid enough to understand what's being said. And I don't know why I doubted, but I did. I doubted. I, I didn't think that was possible. She hasn't known anything for nine years and not me. And I know the story, so it's a good one. So I, we walk up to my mother, we walk out the back door of the church. It's me, my ex-wife, Father Bredis. Father Bredis walks up to her and says, Anna, we're going to see if we can get you to take the Eucharist again soon. And she looks up and smiles real big and said, that would be wonderful. It's been such a long time. And he said, good enough for me. And gave her absolution. And... A few priests have said that she lived her purgatory here on earth with, you know, 12 years of dementia. And mm -hmm. um, that also after she got absolution, because she's not aware of anything she's doing, she's not sinning. So right. she got out, she died, she was in a state of grace. Oh, that's she beautiful. Got, Did she? So she was able to go to daily mass with you, receive Jesus in yep. the Eucharist for the rest of her years? Uh, she received the Eucharist three times. She also mm. got last rites three times. Um, there was a time she was talking gibberish, and we had no idea what she was saying, and it just seemed like she's talking gibberish. And she was meeting, we I had spoken at an Eastern Rite church, Eastern Rite Catholic. Byzantine. And he said, I bet you think your mother is speaking gibberish. I said, Yeah. He goes, That's not gibberish, that's tongues. She's talking to the Holy Spirit. He said, Let me let me show you something. Get real close to her face and watch her face. Notice the lights that are on in this room. It doesn't look like there's any light shining on her face, right? I mean, just the regular lights, but the same that's shining on everybody. We're like, yeah. He goes, wait and see when she goes silent, then watch her face. So she stops talking, and then it looks like a light is shining on her face. Wow. But it didn't come from anywhere. 
And he said, that's the Holy Spirit talking to your mother. When she talks in gibberish, she's talking to the Holy Spirit in a godly language. And since she's not talking to us, we can't understand what she's saying, but the Holy Spirit knows. And so that would happen. Her face would light up and she's listening. And then the light goes out and she starts talking again. And it's again, it's this, whatever it is she's saying, you know, that doesn't make any sense to anybody else. But apparently it made sense to the Holy Spirit. And we were just blown away for years. And we just thought it was nonsense. Wow. Yeah, the gift of tongues is like the, the love language between that person and God. And she's probably just telling God how much she loves him, which, you know, in English, we have one word love. We don't have agape love. We don't have all these different levels. I love your shoes. I love your hair. I love you, my wife, my right. husband. I love you, God. You know, it's the same word. So it's kind of incredible that the priest could see that and tell you that, too. What a blessing. Did I, I think I told you this, but I'm not sure because I've told this story so many times. Did yeah. I tell you about yeah. my my mother doing her homework one day? You did not. She would get up at like every morning at like four or five in the morning and she'd just start talking as soon as she wakes up. And it's like, man, doesn't she ever get tired? And she talks all day until she goes to bed around midnight. So this day she got up at like five in the morning and said that she had a homework assignment to do. Well, she's 70 something years old. And um, at this time, probably around 77 years old, 75, you know, and she hasn't gone to school in, you know, 60 years. But, you know, you can't argue with a dementia patient, just agree with whatever they say, pretty much. And, yeah. you know, she's like, I've got a homework assignment, I've got to work really hard on it. The teacher's expecting a lot from me. Okay. And she's saying this all day long. You know, we have breakfast. She's got a homework assignment. We're at lunch. She's got a homework assignment. We're at supper. She's got a homework assignment. She's got to do this homework assignment. She's worked hard on it all day. She hasn't done anything all day, but, you know, in her mind, she has. Yeah. So my ex-wife is going to bed, and I've got the night shift, so I'm going to watch her overnight. I'm standing in the bedroom door. And just standing there, my ex-wife is laying on the bed, and my mother is in the hospital bed in the living room. And she starts talking, uh, oh, teacher, you're finally here. I've been working hard all day on the homework assignment. I hope you like it. You know, and we're, you know, smiling and just listening to what she's saying. And she said, Teacher, you're so beautiful. What's your name? Mary, that's a beautiful name. Oh, and me and my ex wife go running into the living room. You never know. Mary might have been standing right there. There was nobody yeah. there. It was all that we could see. There was nobody we could see. We run in there and she's talking to Mary. You know, and wow. we're like crossing ourselves and no, don't know what's going on right now, but okay. And um, and then I guess Mary leaves, and she you know, she waves goodbye to Mary, and she looks at us and is like, "Mary was happy with my homework. She said I did a great job." Like, wow. Did you find oh, out what the homework was, or do you not know? No idea. I, I assume it was Mary. Um, <laughs> there was a different day. We had been driving errands all day and we came home. My dad had been watching her and we came in the door and she said, oh, there was a man here visiting me for a while. You know, my dad was like, nobody's been here. And um, he said he knows both of you really well, that he sees you a lot at mass and that he, he loves, he says that you do a lot of work for him, pointing to me is you do a lot of work for him and he's very happy with you and that he'll be seeing me soon. I said, what's his name? Um, he kind of looks like you. He's got long hair and a beard. Uh, 
Jesus, I think. Oh my goodness. Okay. Now, is he talking to you and your ex-wife about going to mass or you and your dad going to mass? Me and my ex-wife, my my dad never went to mass. He went to one mass in his life. It's after he well, after he after he died, he had a funeral mass. Oh, that's the one mass. He, he was he was Baptist and yeah. When getting ready to close to death, I said, you know, you've never been to the Baptist church here. Did you want a, a funeral there? He was like, eh, no, no, I'm good. I said, how about at the Catholic church? He goes, sure. I'll go to that. I'll, I'll, I'll have that. Interesting, because didn't he used to say that all those Catholics are going to hell? Don't bother with them anyway kind of thing? <laughs> well, one day, we used to go to adoration every day. And there was one day I was pulling up at the church. My dad asked me, where are we? And I said, uh, St. Raphael Catholic Church. He's like, what are you doing here? I said, I'm going in for adoration for a few minutes. Did you want the air conditioner left on or do you want the windows down? What do you want? And he said, well, actually, you talk about adoration every day. I'd like to go in and see what all the hullabaloo is about. Okay. Oh my God. So I help my dad. Now we have the type of um, adoration chapel where that if you're the last person there, you go up, genuflect, uh, turn off the candle, close the door to the monstrance, and then turn off all the lights of the room and leave. And then if you are coming in and all that is turned off, you reverse that order and turn everything on and open the monster and so and so you can adore and um he custom made the the monstrance i think in italy and had it shipped to the u.s and it's a beautiful piece and it looks like a giant piece of art and um so i came in the room was dark i helped my dad sit down in a few and then i turned on all the lights turned on the candle and it's an electric candle and then I genuflected and opened up the monstrance. And then genuflected again and went and sat down. And then while we're in there, this large family walks in. And it's like the grandparents, the parents, and all the kids and the grandkids. So it's like a family of about 12 to 15 people. Wow. And they all saw my, they all saw my dad, and I just I know them from our church. And none of them know my dad, but they all spoke to him. And they were very respectful. Which my dad is former military, and he's very big on respect. So disrespecting my dad, he'll never be on his good side again. And respecting my dad, again, he now respects you back. So this family was so nice and polite to him and gave him a good amount of respect. So he smiled and, you know, said hi to all of them. And then I was getting ready to leave and I asked them if they know how to shut everything down. They do. So I genuflected and left, got my dad and we walked outside. We got in the car and I said, so what do you think of your first experience in adoration? He said, it was a very strange experience. I said, why? Why do you think that? And he says, I have never felt such peace and calm and joy, pure joy in a room. Like it was an empty room and I feel joy. Just, I just want to go back. And I oh. said, well, it's not an empty room. I said, you know that big silver thing you saw on the wall with the, the burgundy door? He goes, yes. I said, when I open that door, he said, yes, when you open that door, that's when everything started. I said, well, you're you're advertising the Catholic Church right now. <laughs> I said, that thing that's inside, it's called a uh, host. That's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. I said, you know how that as Baptists, you believe the spirit of God is everywhere. He was right. The spirit of God is everywhere. I said, right, but the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ is only in the Catholic Church. 
and you witnessed it. That's what gives you the joy and the calm and the peace that you felt, that you never felt in a Baptist church. He goes, that is true, I never felt it there. I said, you were just in the presence of God. Amazing, it's too bad. How old was he at this time? Um, probably, he was able to walk, so he was probably about 80. Oh, when did he pass? When he was 84. Okay. In 2014. Well, now I can see why he went and said, oh yeah, you can bury me in the Catholic Church. I'm sure that stuck with him for a while. Four he, years. Um, <laughs> he never went back in. But he got so sick that he couldn't really, he had to be taken in a wheelchair everywhere. And he didn't like going to his doctors. And if he didn't go to the doctor, he could die. You know, he had to go to monthly doctors. And he hated to go monthly. He was like, can I go every six months or every year? And they're like, well, if you want to die, you can do that. You know, so he wasn't wanting to die. But he didn't see it as... You know, when you went to the Baptist church, you'd go and you hear some sermon and then you leave and, you know, you don't really get much out of it. You're not getting the Eucharist when you're there. You're not hearing truth. You know, you're hearing a watered down heresy, you know, and he was starting to listen to EWTN and he was starting to listen to a lot of the programs on church militants and, um, starting to listen to oh I can't think of the guy's name Taylor Mar Dr. Taylor Marshall and mm -hmm. listen to all these Catholic people and he was starting to realize that the Bible he had used all these years was heretical and you know that he wasn't reading the one true Bible and he didn't belong to the one true birth, church or faith you know even my brother's special needs and I asked my brother right in front of my dad, I said, um, Jackie, who started the Catholic Church? And he goes, well, Jesus Christ, of course. I said, did he start any of the Protestant churches? No. Like, dad, why are you Baptist again? Tell me that. <laughs> what do you say? Okay, that no. This is going to sound funny, but my dad really believed this until he watched he watched this on Church Militant. I think Dr. Taylor Marshall. I think something was said on the Terry and Jesse show and one other. He saw four different Catholic shows that talked about this over the period of like a couple of months. He thought that John the Baptist was the first Baptist. Oh. I said, Dad, how is it possible that John the Baptist was the first Baptist and then there were no other Baptists for 1,800 years? And then suddenly, the Baptist church sprung up. And he goes, yeah, I, I, I couldn't really figure that out. I couldn't wrap my brain around that. And then I saw these four programs and I was like, oh, I'm stupid. Yeah. And I said, uh, no, not stupid. I'm just uninformed. Right. I, you know, Zachary, I had someone, uh, I, I did a Good Friday video, um, a couple of other videos, and I've got people that obviously, and he was Baptist, by the way, who was trying, he used the same three Bible verses to tell me that my faith was wrong, that or maybe he was a born again Christian. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure. I, I really am. I'm not sure. But I kept trying to. Oh, we're, we're, we're born again. Okay, maybe he was Baptist. So it was John three three and a couple of other ones. I I I had a long dissertation with him in YouTube comments because I know what I didn't know. I believe that the Catholic Church was just a bunch of rules. I think, you know, Archbishop Fulton Sheen says that there's not a hundred people in America that truly hate the Catholic Church. There's millions of people who hate what they think the Catholic Church is, and I was one of them. 
And so when I went to confession and my life changed, um, this, you know, it was back in 2013, I dove into the faith and it, you know, it's a, it's a part-time job. You're always learning. You're constantly learning. Right. And I think that's one of the things that maybe your dad just heard what he heard, what his parents taught him and what the church taught him. And, oh my gosh, right. I don't want to be anywhere by those Catholics or I'm going to go to hell too. And if you don't look beyond that, um, then you're not going to be informed. And I'm, I'm I, I, so happy to watch DWTN yeah. and all those programs. I had a woman at a conference that was asking me questions in the Q&A. And she told me that she had studied all the world's religions and decided she was going to be a Christian. I said, you're not old enough to have studied all the world's religions. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, let's say that you spent one day studying everybody. Each one got one day. That's 66,000 days. How many years is that? I don't think you're old enough to have studied all the, all those religions. And um, and then if you actually had studied everything, you'd realize that the Catholics were first. We didn't get it wrong. We got it right. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So he didn't say that about the Baptist church or the Presbyterians or any of the Protestants. They weren't here when he said it. Was she not Catholic? No, she wasn't Catholic. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, had I, had a, to... I had a woman at a book signing. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, no. I had a woman at a book signing in St. Augustine a couple of years ago. And she said that she's seen my talks. Uh, she's seen a lot of my interviews. And she can't, for the life of her, figure out why I decided to be Catholic. I said, oh, man, this is a Scooby-Doo mystery. <laughs> figure it out together. All right. Well, let's, well, I'll take you through it step at a time. And then we'll see if I made the right decision or if you think I made the wrong decision. She was like, okay. I said, okay. So this woman came up to me and she handed me a blessed miraculous medal, a devotion only held by the Catholic church. She told me the blessed mother was calling me into her army, a title given by the Catholic church. At some point I realized that the blessed mother was the mother of God a title given by the Catholic Church. When I realized it was the mother of God, Mary showed up. Marian apparitions usually happen in Catholic places. When she showed up, she took me by the hand and turned me around, leading me to her son, which is what Mary does in the Catholic Church. And her son was Divine Mercy Jesus, a devotion held only in the Catholic Church. At the time that I realized all these things that are happening, the last thing I realized is everything Catholic is truth. If and I didn't you with Catholicism, the blank stare. <laughs> if I didn't choose Catholicism, wouldn't that make me the biggest idiot in the room? And she was like, Yes, it would. I said, and then my question back to you is, after you've heard all that, why are you not Catholic? What did she say? I have to go home and rethink my life. Hmm. And she walked out the so, door. So she walked out the door. Well, I'm sure. Oh, boy, it'd be great if she's watching anywhere to reach out to you. Um <laughs> Right. And well, I've had, you know. I've had in the last year, I've had um, one Protestant reach out and say that he used to be an atheist, and he saw my videos and they converted him. I was Protestant, but you know, matter of time. Um, I've had other atheists and agnostics claim that they saw my videos and converted to being Catholic. I've also heard Protestants 
say that they've converted to being Catholic, and I've heard Catholics say that they've come back to their faith. I was in Medjugorje two years ago, and I left, I went to that seven days after the book signing. I got invited to go at the book signing. They paid for me to go. And um, when I was there, this woman screamed. She was pretty far away from me. She screamed and she was yelling in Japanese. And she came running up to me, speaking in Japanese the whole way. And she hugs me and she's speaking Japanese. And I said, I, I don't speak Japanese. And she was, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought I was speaking English. And she hugged me because she was so excited seeing me there because I converted her whole family and brought them all back to the Catholic Church because of my videos on YouTube. And there was, it was we were there at the 40 year anniversary and there was about 30,000 people there and about half of them knew me. They had me speak on Mary TV and they had me speak while I was there, actually do a talk. And um, it was exciting. I mean, I was seeing people from all over the world coming up to me, shaking my hand, saying they, they couldn't believe they were seeing me, you know, seeing me there. And um, they were very excited to see Zachary King. You know, and I was like, okay. Uh, didn't know I was known everywhere. And they're talking about getting me to go to Medjugorje and speak, speak again, you know. Oh, that's that's another, that. one of their youth things. Yeah, but youth, it, I mean. I've heard um, priests tell me that they're priests because of me. They saw my videos and I inspired them to join a seminary and become a priest. Or um, I would talk to them while they were going through the seminary and they were considering quitting. And then they talked to me and a conversation with me convinced them to, you know, and I wasn't trying to convince them to stay. I was just telling them to search their heart and make sure that quitting is what you want to do. You know, I said, you can always quit. You can quit at any time. But let's make sure that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You're going through the for some reason. And I've also converted a bunch of nuns and made them Catholic and made them nuns. You know, inspired them to become nuns. And it's exciting on my part because every time one of them leads somebody to Christ, I get partial credit for that because I helped inspire that. You know, yep, very, it's all about saving souls, right? Yeah, you know, there's um, there's a woman that has bought me nine thousand miraculous medals over time because she's partially handicapped and can't meet as many people as I can. And so she would buy me my medals because anybody that I give a medal to that converts, she gets partial credit for it because she bought me the medals. Now recently we just had another, another guy donated $500 to us so we could buy St. Benedict medals and miraculous medals. So I think we got 500 St. Benedict medals and 2,500 miraculous medals. Awesome. And then what? You get them blessed and then you hand them out? We get them blessed. Uh, every time somebody orders merchandise from us, we send them a blessed miraculous medal. And they're nice quality. They're from St. Paul Street Evangelization. They have made an Italy stamped right on them. And it looks like a very high quality metal. Um, and then we also, on our merchandise table, when I speak at conferences, we give them away. People are funny. They'll come up and they'll grab like one metal. And it's like, what, you only have one friend? One relative? <laughs> well, I know you got more than that. Well, they're just you trying know. to be, you know, not greedy, but that's the whole point. I'm not even sure they even thought about giving it to someone else, right? They were just thinking about themselves. I'll just take one for me, right. you know? So, um, I had this woman, This was I spoke at the NACOM in 2015. 
It's the North American Committee on Divine Mercy and it's put on by the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. And so I was speaking at that and it was a huge event. And this woman came up and my ex-wife used to make rosaries and they were made out of semi-precious or precious stones and they were beautiful and none of them were cheap either. And she didn't charge you for labor. She charged you for labor. You really couldn't afford the rosary. But hmm. this woman came up, saw a rosary that was so beautiful, she burst into tears. And she's crying, staring at it. And she holds it and puts it back. You know, and we tell her how much it is. And she doesn't have that kind of money. She can't afford it. And I was going to turn to my wife, my ex-wife, and say, hey, why don't you give her a discount on it or something? But a priest came up and he said, I want to buy it for her. I mean, we're, we're loaded. We've got priests and um, seminarians all over the place. And so I was going to tell my ex-wife, give the father a discount. And he said, I don't want a discount. I want to pay for it full price. So wow. Wow. We, we sold it to the priest and the priest turned around and gave it to the woman. And he blessed it for her. And she's sobbing and gives him a hug and gives me a hug, gives my ex-wife a hug. And then she disappears back into the conference. Then hours later, she brings her daughter up and her daughter is really young. And she brings her daughter up there because we are giving away the miraculous medals. And the little girl said, I would love to have a miraculous medal. I heard you're giving them away. And we had given the last one out. I told her that we brought 500 medals and we've given all of them away and I, I apologize. And she goes, that's okay. It's okay. And I was wearing a blessed miraculous medal that was made out of sterling silver. And it was really big. It was like, this is half of it. The other half, I can't use my hand because I'm on dialysis. But it was fill the rest of that up, you know, it's like bigger than an egg. And <laughs> bigger than an is, egg. It is sterling silver on a chain. And I took that off and I said, I think Mary wants you to have this. Oh. I, put it, I put it around her neck. I didn't buy it. You know, I mean, I can't imagine how expensive that would be, but it was given to me. And the priest blessed it. And I said, it's already been blessed, Father, but you can do it again. And I put it around her neck and she sobbed. I was like, oh, this runs in this family. And she gives me a hug and, and then she skips away to be with her mom. Then fast forward, let me see, that was in 2015. So it would have been 2020 or 2021. I get a call from my own, that little girl's mother that she's currently visiting convents to see which one she wants to belong to. How old and was she when you gave her that? About? She was between 10 and 12, I think. Oh, that young. Oh. That and thing must have been huge on her. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. But she said that she was discerning what convent to go into. And I told her about uh, servants of the home of the mother. And also, I said, they have a sister convent that I don't remember the name of. It's based in Washington, D.C. But I'm sure if you call them, they can tell you the name of it. I said, all the girls there are young. It looks like when they sleep at night, it's a giant sleepover. And uh, it just looks like a bunch of young girls. And they're all smiles all the time. And they're, they're always joyful in the Lord. And she said that she wanted, to, she wanted to be as generous with herself and with Jesus as I was with her in that medal. Oh. That's what it's all about, right? us being Christ-like to others and having him change us and us be selfless and know, as you know, God give it all to God and God will provide. And look at what, look at what fruit came out of that one 
gesture where you could have been, hey, I'm not giving this away. This is, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is my puppy, you know, and, and you did. And and how great that you you can actually see the fruit. There's nothing cooler right. than that, you know. This, this um, is my sterling silver medal. Mm -hmm. I could melt this down and get some money. <laughs> right. I couldn't imagine somebody melting down a miraculous metal. Yeah. So well, I, have one, I have one other story about a nun. Yeah. Um, somebody called me one day and they said, Do you remember Sister Mary? I said, They're all named Sister Mary. <laughs> I remember one. And they said, You got into an argument with this nun. I said, <laughs> can't remember ever arguing with a nun and she said it was about the price of some cds i said oh yeah i remember that i said i was in uh, father hollop's church it's near chicago and she came up to me and wanted to know how much my stuff was and i said i give stuff free to priests and religious also seminarians so if you're a deacon, a priest, a nun, you know, a nun of any level, you know, you could have just entered and I'll still give you free stuff, you know? And she goes, well, I, I can't take it for free, but I'll pay for it. And I was like, well, I can't take your money, but I'll give it to you for free. And she's like, well, I can't take it then. I said, yeah, I, I'm giving it to you. It's a gift. You know, she's like, well, I can't take it. And finally we negotiated and I said, well, what, what CD do you want? And she mentioned the CD she wanted. And I said, how about if I give you everything I sell for that $7? She goes, okay. So she does that. We, we trade. And she goes, did you make any money on this deal? I said, I'm pretty sure I did not. <laughs> she said, okay. But you're fine with this. And I'm fine with that. So she takes one of each of everything I've got. And I get, I think it was $6. So I get that. And I said, okay, what about her? She goes, did she ever tell you what she did with that CD? No. So I have a talk called For We Wrestle Not Against Flesh and Blood. It was from a spiritual warfare conference that I did called Putting on the Armor of God. And that was in Arlington Heights, Illinois. That's uh, right by me. Really? Right. Just letting you know. In October 2011. It was put on by Zena O'Callaghan, and I, uh, I they recorded that, and she went and gave it to a woman that was living an immoral lifestyle. Now, I wasn't told what that meant. She was just living an immoral lifestyle. So use your imagination. Think whatever you want, I suppose. That woman listened to it listen to it again, decided that being Protestant wasn't enough. She never went to church as a Protestant. So she joined RCIA. Oh, she became yeah. a Catholic. And then she kept listening to my CD like every day. And then once she was Catholic, she decided she wants to fight under Mary's banner, but she can't do it she can't protest at the abortion mill. She can't go to mass as much as she wants to. If she's got a secular job and is paying bills and is renting. So she applied to different convents and got accepted. And now she's a nun. And she goes around giving talks about what she used to do and one day somebody gave her a CD by Zachary King and that changed her life. And what she learned on the CD and then what she did. I don't know what the woman's name is. I just know that she's a nun in the Chicagoland area. Hmm. Maybe I'll have to go search her or something. That That's great. I mean... It's all worth it when you think about where you came from and now right. you're again under Mary's mantle and in her army, your Olga promote that uh, ministry again. 
It's Our Lady of Guadalupe's Army. Um, we have a website. It's not completed yet. And you can go and look at it. It's not done. Have mercy on what you think about it. Um, <laughs> we fight uh, the, the devil and the Antichrist pretty much head to head. Every time there's an abortion, there's a demon that's released from hell. That's according to every exorcist says that. So, and then every night, and I know this from being in a satanic coven in the past, that every night from midnight to 3 a.m. in all 24 time zones around the world, they consecrate all the abortions in that time zone to Satan and the Antichrist. So we're, we're conducting, we're writing a prayer right now that will be given to a bishop, and the bishop is the former exorcist and a current canon lawyer, and he will decide when we've crafted the perfect prayer, so there's no loopholes in it, and then we're going to have priests around the world say masses and say that prayer in every time zone around the world. So it negates consecrations to Satan and the Antichrist. Wow. And, in doing so, and in doing so, we are, on the one hand, painting a giant target on our backs, but on the other hand, we're taking on the devil and the Antichrist and trying to shut down their power. You know, we can't stop people from having abortions but we can stop the consecrations. Yeah, so who's cons who's doing the consecration of all those abortions in these different time zones? Uh, Satanists. Okay. Satanists do a mass starting at midnight and it ends at 3 a.m. where they consecrate all the aborted babies of that day in their time zone. Wow. Yeah. And some of us may get up between 12 and 3. Some of us may pray. We should pray. We can pray the Hail Mary, pray a rosary if we're not able to fall back asleep. I know there are people that have issues. Um, I myself have woken up exactly at 3 on a few occasions, and it right. creeped me out. I started praying the Hail Mary. And there are things that we as individuals can do as well, even though we don't have the perfect prayer, to try to bring light to the darkness. Well, what I recommend people to do is that Satan likes to mimic God. You know, midnight is the witching hour. 3 a.m. is the devil's hour. It's a mockery of divine mercy hour. So if you're going to get up at 3 a.m., play the, pray the divine mercy chapter. Ah, good point. Yeah. So what this, you know, what else... When we're talking about we're not fighting human beings here, we're fighting powers and principalities and spirits, and we're talking about spiritual warfare, what else should we be looking out for that, that we can see either in ourselves, whether something's coming after us or someone's cast a spell on us? And the reason I say this, I have a friend that when I first you know, got into my ministry and left my executive career in corporate America and said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share the Catholic faith in a full-time way. I met her. She told me that she was attacked by witchcraft. It was a person that was in her church who had at-home Catholic prayer sessions. And she kind of saw weird things up in the kitchen. They were what she thought praying in tongues, but probably casting spells. And then stuff happened to her, like her family and her kids got attacked by demons, horrible nightmares. She saw things in her bedroom. They had to move kind of thing. So I guess, and I wasn't really, you know, I'm in my la-la land with Jesus at this time. I don't really understand the, the spiritual war. I'm just so joyful and happy. So I kind of did it really not. And I want us to all know that, yes, this stuff happens, because then later I went to go speak to 160 priests in the Rockford Diocese, and I got attacked. I was totally obsessed in my mind. I couldn't think of anything. 
And when I, at that time I had a spiritual director, he was a priest and he's like, yes, you were being attacked. And I did Unbound, which is by Neil Lozano. I call it like spiritual warfare 101 kind of thing. But anyway, we all, I mean, we may know that there's a God and there's a devil or a Satan or whatever we want to call him name wise, but he does attack us. And in some ways that we don't even think about it. So I'm going to be quiet now, toss it over to you. What is it that we should all be looking at in our lives and people around us? One thing that's excited about Rockford, Illinois, the diocese, is that they shut down an abortion mill with one to four priests every day going out to an abortion mill saying exorcism prayers in front of it. I did not know that. We'll shut down an abortion mill doing that. That's one of the four ways I say to shut down an abortion mill. Beautiful. I didn't know that. Amazing. Gonna have to find out who those that, four priests are. Sacraments and sacramentals. We need to embrace those things as Catholics. You know, we need to embrace that. You know that if you don't get married in the Catholic Church, your marriage is not valid. And a lot of people don't realize, even Catholics don't realize that. They don't realize they can't go get married on the beach because it's a beautiful place. You know, why can't I get married in my friend's Baptist church instead of my Catholic church? Because your wedding is not valid now. God does not recognize you and he sees you living in fornication until you write that marriage and have it done in a Catholic church. Um, you know, it, the, all the... We have everything, including holy orders, if you so wish. But, you know, we have um, First Communion and we have uh, Baptism and we have all these things for a reason. Each one of these steps protects you. You know, it, the Protestants are funny and they're like, what sins did a, an infant commit? Original sin. <laughs> all of us are born with original sin. You know, this eliminates original sin and puts the child under the umbrella heading of being obedient to their parents. This gives them protection. You know, it's like, don't wait till you're 12 years old. What happens if your child dies when they're 11? Where do they go? You know, we're not sure. But according to the Bible, they might be in hell. And I hate to say that. There's people that are going to be like, oh, my gosh, you just said my 11-year-old son's in hell. Well, read the Bible. The Bible says it. You know, I've, also, I've also heard, I'm going to interrupt you here. The exorcist priests say that when, you know, your child is born, until they're baptized, they belong to Satan. Right. That was, I can't remember which exorcist priest said that, but I've heard it from a couple of them. Yeah, I've heard it from more than one as well. Um, but, you know, getting... It's so easy to get a blessed medal. Buy a medal and have it blessed. What's so hard about that? And then wear it. Keep it on you at all times. Demons are not a fan of the St. Benedict medal, and they're not a fan of the miraculous medal. Now, and the scapular, right? And well, the scapular. You know. the different colors of scapulars. You know, there's a lot of scapulars out there. Make sure you definitely are wearing the brown one. Uh, the purple one is a lot of protection. The red one is good, but you got to be pretty faithful Catholic to, to do everything that it says you have to do. Um, and there's also a white and a black. And, um, a blue? Blue, blue, blue one if you're consecrated to green. Mary. Green one is for salvation. I, I used to stick, uh, my husband passed away, I used to stick little uh, green scapulars in the back seat of his uh uh, car seat. I had him underneath the mattress. I mean, everywhere he sat in the house, I had the green uh, scapular because he, he wasn't practicing going to mass every week. I've told parents to, uh, at your house, you're, you're over your, your children, pry away the door frame, put it in there, nail it back up. They can't, they can't see it. They know it's there. But every time they walk in their room, mad at you and slam the door. They're in their room alone with a green scapular. Smart thinking. Um, um, by the way, for anyone who gets the 
the brown scapular, you have to have a priest pray a prayer over you and enroll you. And I want everyone to know that these aren't like lucky charms. Like you literally right. have to have a life in the state of grace. You have to practice how Jesus wants you to live. You can't just put this on, go have sex with anyone you want, steal, do drugs, and and think that this will protect you, you know? Now, you know, the, the again, the Protestants think that, you know, it's grace alone, and it's not grace alone. You have to practice good works. You cannot just get saved and then decide, I'm going to go rape, murder, privilege, do whatever I want to do, and I can still get to heaven, because once saved, always saved. Because I seem to recall a verse in Revelation and a verse in Galatians that tells you everybody that will not inherit the kingdom of God, and at the end of it, it doesn't say, once saved, always saved. St. Paul says, figure out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that verse also doesn't end with, once saved, always saved. You know, it's like you cannot accept Christ into your heart and then decide, I'm going to do whatever I want. Exactly. You know, and have to have Christ Sorry, go ahead. You have to act Christ-like. You have to do the things that Christ did. You know, I had a, had a I had another guy say at one of my conferences that anybody can do an exorcism because Jesus did them in the Bible. I said, you know, Jesus was God, right? And he was, well, well, yes, he was God. I said, there's a lake right out there behind the church that I'm speaking in. I want to see you walk across it. When you can walk across it like Jesus did, you can perform an exorcism like Jesus did. He went out there, took off his socks and shoes, and sunk about four feet into the water. Came back into the church and it had water up in his eyes, upper thighs. Said that he still couldn't perform an exorcism. Like, right. It's it's strange that. They see that one thing in the Bible and think, we can do that because Jesus did. But they don't consider all the rest of the things Jesus did. How come you're not turning water to wine? How come you're not walking across the water? How come you're not curing the sick? Why aren't you healing the blind? Why do you only want to do this one thing? So, yeah, I mean, I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. We have this delay, and it's the worst. It happened on the last video, too. So go ahead. Keep going. Um, if anybody is wanting blessed miraculous medals or blessed St. Benedict medals, um, I have close to 3,000 blessed miraculous medals and probably about 1,500 St. Benedict medals. These are great for bearing in your yard, putting them at the four corners of your house, put them in every room of your house, put them including in closets, including the, the, the water closet, the, um, the furnace, um, uh, the linen closets, uh, cabinets. You know I mean? You might live in a big house and you've got 30 rooms. You know, these things didn't cost me anything. They're already blessed. Send me an email, tell me what you want. I'll mail you whatever you ask for. These things are free. I can't sell them. They lose the blessing. I was just going to go there with you because that is true that we, you know, when people, when things are blessed, you can't sell them or the blessing goes away. Um, that's right. amazing that you are offering that. Um, there's also perimeter prayers that go along with, with that. Uh, also, we just, with we just had a uh, Palm Sunday. Um, if you save the palms, bury those at the four corners of your house and it'll protect your house from storms like hurricanes and tornadoes there's also a pieta prayer book storm prayer that uh we should all know and have we could just look it up p-i-e-t-a prayer for storms and it's beautiful yes. it actually saved me i ran into my basement thought a tornado was coming we had sirens everywhere I texted that prayer to all my neighbors i'm like start praying this and it went right around our town don't know if that's the credit, but I will give credit <laughs> to God on that one. Um, my my church, Lehigh Acres, Florida, 
we used to pray that every year because every year is hurricane season down there. Mm. And multiple, we had a tornado once that went right past the church and we had multiple hurricanes and we would go there for daily mass. And we don't care that there's a hurricane coming. We got mass to go through. And we'd go there and pray the prayer. And we never had any damage from the hurricane to the church. You know, people don't realize, you know, people like, you know, they'll ask me, you know, my, my child isn't, isn't Catholic. They're not practicing. What can I do? Well, pray for them. Don't stop praying. What else can I do? Like, well, I don't know who you're praying to, but my God can do anything. You know, it's like people think that prayer is just like I'm praying to the air and nothing's happening. It's like develop a relationship with a saint and then pray to that saint for everything. You know, whether it's your your patron saint of, you know, whatever it is when you when you are uh, confirmed. You know, my confirmation saint is, is Saint Benedict. I wish I'd have known uh, St. Expeditus at that time because I currently pray. St. Expeditus got me my wife in eight months. I, I was praying oh, for specific How things. did you find St. Expeditus? Um, one of my friends called me one day and she was telling me how great she does a devotion to the infant of Prague and to St. Expeditus and that she swore by St. Expeditus. And so I looked St. Expeditus up, and I also had her tell me. So have you ever heard the story of St. Expeditus? I haven't. That's why I'm asking you to tell me, how did you find that saint? Um, and I'm sure there's others who also don't know. Well, I'll, I'll tell the story of what I know. Um, St. Expeditus what, lived back in the time, like right after Jesus. And... He was a Roman centurion, and he was trying to be a good man. He was worshiping the gods that were nice and kind. They didn't ask for human sacrifices. They didn't ask for him to kill his children. So he was just trying to be a good man. And one day, out of like a puff of smoke, Satan appears to him and tells him not to convert to Christianity. And then just like that, Satan's gone. And he realizes that if the enemy of the Christian God is real, then the enemy of Satan must be the one true God. So he decides he wants to be a Christian. And he goes and he finds some Christians. He tells them what happened. They convert him and they baptize him. And then he gets called before Caesar. And Caesar wants to know, did you become a Christian today? Yes. He said, I've got to take care of some business. And when I come back, I'm going to ask you again. And if you say yes, I'm going to have you taken out and executed. So St. Expeditus figured that if Jesus died for me, I'd be a fool to not die for him. So Caesar comes back and talks to St. Expeditus. St. Expeditus confirms he is a Christian. He says, you know, we're going to take you out and execute you. One last chance. He says, I'm a Christian. Take me out and execute me. So they took him out and executed him. And I tell people, you know, when St. Expeditus woke up that day, he didn't know Satan was going to appear to him. He doesn't know Satan was going to tell him not to convert to Christianity. He didn't know he was going to become a Christian and get baptized, have all of his sins erased, and then be martyred, and then step into heaven that same day. That was a great day for him, and it all happened so quickly. And now everything I ask him for happens quickly. And so just to clarify for all of our Protestant brothers and sisters, you are asking him to pray and intercede to Jesus for you and everything that you ask. You're not actually asking him for it per se. Yeah. Got to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's strange that they get, the, they get intercessory prayer, but 
but they don't get saints praying for you, even though it talks about it in the Old Testament, having saints praying for you. Yeah, and they also prayed for the dead. I mean, that was part of the Jewish right. ritual. Right. So, um, another thing that I wanted to just interject for people who are like, what else can I do other than pray? Um, it's just us also adding fasting and sacrifice to that prayer because even the vicar of Christ, Peter, came to Jesus and said, hey, why can't we cast out these demons? And Jesus is like, look, you got to add some prayer and fasting to cast out some of these demons. And let's be honest, it's demons that we're fighting in our addictions, in our pornography problems, in our prom promiscuity, fornication, whatever you want to call it, adultery. If anybody has a porn addiction, I have a book called Delivered by Matt Fred that we buy by the case and then we get them blessed by priests and we give them out for free. So also if anybody has a porn addiction and you'd like one of those books, email me or call me. And my website is allsaintsministry.org. My email address is mysticgod at yahoo.com. My phone number is 802-578-6554. And we will send you these things for free. Amazing. Amazing. I love that friend. We have paperwork on, uh, we have an examination of conscience form that we can either mail you or you can go to my website and download a PDF of it. It's really good. It's by Ignatius Press. It's one of the better examination of conscience forms that I've seen. We also have, when The Hunger Games was going to come out, the movie, and the books were out, somebody called me and asked me if the books were okay. And I said, I don't know, I've never read one. Back then I could see. And I said, if you buy me the book, buy it in the bigger print, I'll read it and I'll tell you what's in it. So they bought me all three books and I took notes of what's objectionable in every book on what page it's on and what it says exactly. And we have a printout of that. We also have a video of it on my YouTube channel. And we'll walk you through in the, in the videos, it tells you uh, part one, two, and three. And my niece actually reads it as to what's objectionable in all of it. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen The Hunger Games or read the books. It's all but one. Remember, these things are written for like 12 year olds. So imagine your 12 year old son is reading this and there's something like 30, I don't remember the exact number, but there's multiple references to Katniss Everdeen being nude. Then you can go see the movie where you don't really see her nude, but you can see what she looks like. And if you're a boy, it doesn't take much to imagine that woman nude. Why would you put this in a book? Mm -hmm. Why do you have this girl appearing naked in a book that 12-year-olds are going to read? And, and it's multiple things that are objectionable all the way through all three books. And there's, um, in the book, there's pictures of baby angels with wings that she thinks are disgusting. She's describing care of them. There's no God in any of the three books. Uh, it's better to commit suicide than to die of starvation. They even have a song about suicide. Wow. I was just looking at my notes here. Um, but I'm not even going to look at it <laughs> because I think that's another thing is what you, you know, with kids where you can help control some of what they look at. And this is the problem with technology. You can't always know, especially if they have a phone, unless you have some sort of covenant eyes or some sort of something installed on it. Um, I just think we need to be aware. And as, as parents with kids that you have some control over, you've got to insert yourself into their or lives. Get, get Bark. And in Bark, it doesn't stop them from going anywhere, but it shows you what they're doing, what keystrokes they're entering, 
who they're talking to, what they're saying, what that person is saying to them. You know, you may think your child is nice and innocent until you see the stuff they tell somebody or somebody is telling them. And you're going to you're gonna have a whole new world opened up to you as a parent when you see the language your children use or the places they go or the activities that they do that you didn't know about. And it's shocking. You know, kids yeah, just say, hey, I know their parents aren't looking or they don't know their parents are there. And Bark is a program that you get. It goes on your phone, your laptop, uh, your tablet, and then it also goes on their stuff, but it's undetectable by them. Yeah, I was going to say, can those smart kids figure it out and take it off? No. No. Hmm. Bark, B-A-R-K. They, they may get mad that you put it on there, but they're under your supervision. You know, when you stop acting, acting like this, I'll stop patrolling you. And you might have to be 18 and moved out of the house. So let's go there. What do we do with our kids? You know, I mean, I've got a 30 year old and a 27 year old, uh, both boys. Uh, they're with their girlfriends. They're living in sin. Both girls are Catholic. They're they're Lutheran. Uh, my husband's children from a previous marriage. And I speak all the time about my faith. I forwarded them your, uh, let me see, which I think it was with Christine Bacon. I for It was so long. So I don't even know if they watched it. But I said... I, you know, I said, you know what? You've got to watch this. I want to talk about it at Easter, which we didn't, but they're not off the hook. You know, I just, I said, you know, you guys asked me what to do, what, what you could do for me when, when their father died in January. I said, you can watch this. And I just want to under, I want to talk about it. So I'm going to have to do that at another time because it just wasn't the right appropriate time. But I've been I forwarding hope, your, go ahead. I would say an opinion to Mary Undoer of Knox and say an expeditus and be specific on what you want. You know, like I tell, I have uh, people that their son or daughter is involved in new age and they don't see the harm in it. And it all seems so happy that there's only heaven. There's only angels. There's only good things happening. Everybody goes to heaven. And I said, okay, Pray to Mary Undoer of Knots and St. Expeditus. St. Expeditus because it will happen quickly. Mary Undoer of Knots because she'll take care of it. And what you want Mary to do is to make the demons reveal themselves to your children. Make them see that there's dark shadows in the world. There's dark shadows on their wall and there's no light to create a shadow. Where's that shadow coming from? Who is that demon sitting at the foot of their bed? You know, bring them back to the church, scare them, but show them that that, real, that world is real, that the devil is real, demons are real, hell is a real place. Make the demons give them horrific dreams. You know, scare them into it, but they'll go to confession. You know, Mary is great at doing things like that. Can you explain what you mean by new age so that people know? I mean, I know it's so wide. Uh, for yeah, I one, mean, I know yoga I mean, for one thing. Go ahead. Yoga, Buddhism. Um, I mean, Google search new age religion. Even uh, Jehovah's Witness is a new age. Any, any religion or foundation or following that takes out God, the devil, heaven or hell is a new age religion that's a good definition that's a lot that is a lot but i mean um buddhists take out heaven and hell and god and the devil depending on which sect you belong to because there's four different ones um jehovah's witnesses take out hell they also think that jesus and saint michael the archangel are the same person even though it doesn't say that in the Bible. What about this universe? 
-hmm. kind of like, oh, I'm going to manifest abundance in my life and I'm going to have the universe give me what I want, what I need. I mean, obviously it doesn't have God or heaven or hell. It sounds like it's all the universe, but that's huge. There are people who are really. And Satan is in control of this planet. So if you're looking to the planet or the universe to give you something, you're praying directly to Satan. Now, yeah. nowhere, in the, world is nowhere God, in the world in the Bible. Go nowhere ahead. in the Bible does God promise you wealth. He doesn't promise you success. He doesn't promise you and the Joel Olstein scenario is not. That's not what God teaches. God teaches. They persecuted me, so they're going to persecute you. You know, he, he tells you to pick up your cross and follow him. You know, it's it's a painful road. You know, offer it up, and then eventually you'll see heaven. But you've got to live like you've got to live memento mori. Are you familiar with memento mori? No. No. Memento Mori, I've got a t-shirt, a hoodie, a sweatshirt. They all show a big skull on them. And down at the bottom, it says Memento Mori. It's a Latin term. It means remember death. So hmm. I had a priest ask me. He said, that's kind of scary. And I said, it's Memento Mori, Father. And he was, I don't know what that means. I said, you speak Latin, Father. He said, it means remember death. And he's like, is that a devotion of the church? I said, yes, but it's older than the church. When generals used to go on campaigns in the Roman army, and they would be being honored in the streets, and the people are chanting their name, their soldiers are chanting memento mori, because you may be being honored today in the streets, but tomorrow you might be dead. And all that honor in the street didn't do anything for you in the afterlife. You have to live this life as if your afterlife depends on it, because it does. You know, if you're rape, robbing, and pillaging, where do you expect you're going to go when you die? If you didn't worship God while you were on earth, wouldn't that be hell to put you in heaven so you can worship God? So as a favor to you, he sends you to hell where you're separate from God. But do we really want to go there? Because it's not a party. You're burning and being attacked by demons every day. You know, it's like they rip you to shreds. You reform, they rip you to shreds. You know, they keep doing this all day long for eternity. It doesn't sound very pleasant to me. You know, all you've got to do is behave for the teardrop of the time that you're here and then you get to die. Now my prayer, and we pray rosaries every day for this, that me and my family die as martyrs. I'd like to guarantee that my kids go to heaven and I can't guarantee it any other way but martyrdom. So that's funny that you say that because I was always thinking Wow, what you're doing, who you were. And again, this is great that we are not going through your story chronologically because there's so many videos out there that people can watch. But I I always think like, dude, why are you still here? You should be dead because of what you are doing, what you have shared, you know, like, and now you're talking about martyrdom and I pray that that doesn't and although you pray that it does, I, that's insane because you know a lot about the way that high level people, the elites, how, whatever you want to say their names, right. there's a lot of powerful people that, that you know are into this satanic life. Well, I had, I had an interview yesterday and somebody asked, how am I not dead yet? And I said, well, two things. One, if I'm killed, that adds credence to my story. That makes me legitimate. If they ignore me, I'm just a nutbag out there talking BS, and maybe I just made it all up. 
But the other reason that I think I'm still alive is because Mary keeps me safe. Mary decides when I'm going to die. She decides he's right for martyrdom now. He's done enough stuff. He's opened enough eyes. Now I can die a murder. You know, I'm good with that. You know, if if I'm going to die a martyr, that's, that's how I want to go. You know, I'd rather go that way than peacefully in my sleep because I can't guarantee that I've been to <laughs> confession in time to die peacefully in my sleep. You know, that might be nice to die peacefully in my sleep. It might be nicer than having ISIS cut my head off or somebody pull a bullet between my eyes or, you know, kill me in a hail of gunfire. Dying in my sleep might be nicer than that. But dying in my sleep may not get me to heaven. And dying as a martyr will. Right. And that's why we have confession, everyone, because it's not easy to walk the narrow path. It says in the Bible that few will make it through the gates. And, and that's why we have confession. That's why we have that beautiful sacrament. And don't worry, you're not confessing to the priest. He's in persona Christi. You're speaking to Jesus. Yeah. And it's just, I love confession. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, when my husband retired a couple years ago, I stopped going to daily mass. Stopped going to weekly confession. My prayer life suffered because I said, "Well, he's home now, so I need to be a wife, and and that's my that's my calling, that's my role." And that was the stupidest thing I could have ever done. Number one, because he used to tell me how awesome I was when I went to mass. Number two because I let the sacraments down in my life and then marijuana crept back in and it started becoming, you know, a, a daily thing that was happening. I was already, you know, probably drinking too much as well. And that I, when you say stay close to the sacraments, if you can go to daily mass, go to daily mass and take advantage of confession every single time you fall into mortal sin. I'm just saying there's something to this beautiful Catholic church that keeps you in that state of grace. Thank yeah, God. I mean, and I encourage you, if you're Protestant, you're listening to this and you're thinking, no way is the Catholic church the one true church, research it. Check out the church fathers. You'll find they were all Catholic. Check out the desert fathers. They were all Catholic. You know, when Jesus was here, you had the choice of belonging to three churches. You could be pagan, you could be Jewish, or you could be Catholic. That was your only choice. When Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, he meant the Catholic church, because there was no Protestant church here for 1,500 years. Yeah. So he wasn't yeah. referring to the Protestants. Exactly. And it, so can you... If you think that the Catholic Church has fallen, then you're calling Jesus a liar because he said it will not fall, that the gates of hell will not prevail. Even though they're trying. Do you know anyone um, that is a Satanist that, that has infiltrated the church that you're aware of? Uh, joy of Satan. That's their job. That they, they infiltrate the Catholic Church and try to bring it down from the inside. Hmm. Um, I know, it, did you ever read, I could, I might have the, not the name wrong, but it's something like AA 1025. No. Okay. So this woman was, used to be a nurse and this guy was brought in in a horrible traffic accident. And when the police came in, they gave the nurse this briefcase. And they said, this belongs to that guy. And they're looking at the guy. He's not going to make it. So the guy dies, I think, that night. And the nurse takes the briefcase home, puts it in the closet. And about 30 years later, she is it's killing her. It's eating her up inside. But she doesn't know what's in this briefcase. It might be empty. But she wants to know. So she opens up the briefcase to look at it. And it's got a book transcript in it. And she reads the book, and it's short, and she publishes it. 
And in that book, this guy, is, the number of the book is the agent name that he had, the secret agent name he had. He was a communist in the Communist Party. And he joined the Catholic Church to bring it down, to become a priest. Oh. And there was thousands of these people that joined seminaries to become priests so that eventually they would be uh, bishops and archbishops and cardinals, and maybe one of them would become the pope, and they would bring down the Catholic Church. So there's a story about how they were going to bring down the Catholic Church. And their story, as you read, this book came out prior to Vatican II, but they describe Vatican II, how that they're going to start giving communion in the hand and mm. take away the communion rails and make it so that the priest will face everybody instead of having his back to everybody and facing Jesus. You know, when you read the book and wow. you're like, oh my gosh, that's everything that happened. And yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised, but that's a, I'm going to have to look that book up. That sounds sounds really good. And what about black masses? I mean, if if that wasn't truly Jesus in the Eucharist, then why would they be stealing him so they right. can yeah. him on their own black mass? How come they don't steal the Baptist Wonder Bread? How come they only steal the Catholic Coast? And it's a Satan friendly person that steals it. It's usually not a statement. And then they take it and they sell it. They get the 30 pieces of silver. So they sell it anywhere from $1,500 for a cheap one, $15,000 for an expensive one, with the average price being about $5,000. Why on earth, let me ask the Baptist people out there listening, why on earth would anyone pay $5,000 or a worthless piece of bread, unless it's not a worthless piece of bread. And they know, here's the kicker, Satanists know when it's been consecrated. Even the atheists oh. know when it's been consecrated because they feel extreme revulsion or hatred towards the host when it's been consecrated. Hmm. Little do they know that it's 100% God and it's 100% love and justice. So it's probably the love that's making them feel the hatred they do. Wow, that's amazing. And for, again, people who have, I, I've witnessed seeing Jesus drop on the floor and People freak out. I mean, you've got the priest who's eating the host, consuming the host as soon as possible. I've seen a priest lick the floor to get up right. every last bit of Jesus. I mean, there's there's a reason that we receive reverently. I, in the beginning, received on my hand in my journey, again, back to 2013. And now I'm kneeling on the tongue and only with a priest. I mean, nothing against those... Right. Uh, you know, extraordinary ministers, but I'm only from a Eucharistic, Eucharistic monsters. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to catch flack for that one, but <laughs> you are. yes, you I, are. Um, listen, you can call me and cuss me out if your hands have been consecrated by the bishop, yeah. so yeah. you can touch the host like a priest. If your hands have not been consecrated by the bishop, you can't touch the host with your hands. So yeah. if you're a Eucharistic monster and your hands have been consecrated by the bishop, call and tell me. Because I'm yeah, going to. That's why I only receive from the priest. You know, I, yeah. I've never received in the hand. I've only taken in the hand one time, and it was an unconsecrated host. And I was at an FSSP church. And I told the priest, if somebody asks, what do I think of receiving on the tongue versus the hand? Or if somebody asks about stealing hosts, then I need an unconsecrated host so I can make a demonstration. And we had that question came up. 
at the same time. One person behind the other asked these two questions at the same time. And the priest looked at me and said, you've been listening to the Holy Spirit. And um, so I said, Father, why do I have to hold my hands to take those? I've never taken it in the hand. So he showed me how to hold my hands. And I said, okay, you put it in my hand and I'm gonna take the host. So he put it in my hand, I popped it in my mouth and I said, where's the host? Where did I put it? And half the room said I put it in my mouth. And the other half said I still had it in my hand. So I showed them my hand, rolled up my sleeves. It's not in my sleeve anywhere. It's not in the other hand. I then opened my mouth and had somebody look in my mouth. It wasn't in my mouth. I opened my mouth and shook my head. It doesn't fall out. Is it in your beard? No, I said, Father, where'd I put it? And Father said, I thought you put it in your mouth. I said, the thing I just did is called palming. It's a trick that Satanists do. Now, you all thought I put it in my mouth. Half of you think I put it in my mouth. Just as Father is standing right here. He gave it to me. He thought I put it in my mouth. The rest of you think I put it in my hand. Now, pay attention. And I put my hand in my pocket and I pulled it out of my pocket. I said, I just put that in my pocket in front of 500 people and a priest. And none of you saw me do it. Wow. I, I have never done that trick before. Imagine how good somebody is that does it every day. Yeah. And I've seen priests who have called out people who start walking away. They're not intending to steal Jesus, but they are just walking away. And he says, consume that right here. So thank you, priests who have stopped people from that. But amazing. I took one and I, I took the unconsecrated one. I put it on my tongue. And I said, now this is why you can't sell a consecrated host that's been in the mouth. And I rolled it over a couple of times and brought it out. I said, now it's stained. And it'll stay stained. I can't sell this. It's been used. You have to sell one that's consecrated, that's never been touched, and by a tongue. So they can't take it. They can't do it. Also, like the ones that, that are done at the Byzantine Church. 